later. Okay. Um, today we were supposed to have a con lecture, but to my understanding, you've already had like seven con lectures. Yes. Um, so I'm not going to put you through that. Also, Garrett's not here, and I did not write a con lecture, so it's not going to happen. All right. Um, what we're going to talk about today are different theories of justice. So. Justice, obviously, is one of the most common value premises used in LT. Um, does anybody have like a basic definition of justice that comes to mind? Like, as long as Best definition of justice. All right. These are two basic. Yes. Uh, giving you to do. What? Giving you to do. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of plays into due process slash rights based approaches. Yeah. Um, so these are two basic working definitions of justice that will come up repeatedly in LD because they're sort of self referential and simple to use. These also play into classical ideas of justice, which we're going to talk about first. So if you're organizing your notes, make divisions for a classical. modern, and then social justice. <clears throat> you can also call this legal. So this would probably apply more to the varsity kids, but the classical version of justice or theory of justice that we're going to talk about first is Pluto's which plays into Rawls heavily. So we're going to talk about Rawls in essence. So I'm assuming we've spoken about Rawls at some point, right? OK. What is the common value criterion associated with Rawls' theory of justice slash Rawls' basic viewpoint? Yep. Justice is fairness, but there is a specific the veil of ignorance. Yeah. So, can somebody explain like the veil of ignorance? What it means to be under the veil of ignorance in concept? Mm -hmm. Uh, if you didn't know what your place was going to be in society, the just action is the one you would want. Exactly. So the veil of ignorance as a concept is a thought experiment that proposes that under circumstances in which nobody knows anything, like autobiographical or otherwise, about their position in society, they would always take the most just action because they could fit into any of the positions. It's a starting point for theorizing justice. It plays into Pluto's conception of justice because Pluto understood justice to be the same thing, but a, a more applied to a, a societal level. And Pluto also believed heavily that philosophy should be the ruling um, sort of mantra or impetus in society writ large. So veil of ignorance, you'll hear it a lot. And it plays into other ideas of justice because most classical, um, classical theories of justice are built off of this built off of the idea that justice is equality for all in a value-neutral format, and that there are different ways to achieve that. Are there some things you think might be problematic about Rawls' veil of ignorance? Mm -hmm. We don't live in like, that type of society where yeah. things are completely just. Exactly. Well, one, society is not completely just. And then two, this is sometimes called the view from nowhere.
It's called that pejoratively because some people are understood to take a hue from nowhere and other people are understood not to be able to do such a thing. So people who, and I guess we'll talk about this more when we talk about social justice and social justice approaches to achieving justice, um, people who face things like um, systemic violence that influences the way they think about the world or the relationship they have to society are unable to um, cast off their subject position in the same way that people who are relatively privileged might be able to. So you'll hear view from nowhere um, associated with the veil of ignorance pejoratively. Keep that in mind. So what do you think is the logical extension of, like we talked about, an idea of justice of being value neutral and totally fair to something like the governance of society? Well, what is necessary for the governance of society to occur? I guess is a better question. Law? Yeah, law, the legal system. And this is where, and this plays into obviously like modern theories of justice. Um, this is where you get two main distinctions or branching points for how society should go about accomplishing equality under law. The first that we'll talk about is known as classical liberalism. So, The major tenet of classical liberalism is that we should not forfeit individual rights for group-based rights or class rights. So, Um, one of our novice debaters used a pretty, I think, striking example to illustrate this. It's kind of stupid, no offense, Mahesh, but it gets the point across really well because it helps to, again, illustrate what this concept means in application. So, essentially, if you have two individuals who want um, two different cupcakes and you give them the choice between vanilla and chocolate, one person chooses chocolate, the other person should only be entitled to either chocolate or vanilla, not another vanilla cupcake if they choose chocolate so that they both can have one vanilla cupcake. Because the idea is that both of them having one cupcake is better than one person having two so as to achieve total equality in terms of the quality of that equality, if that makes sense. So the idea is that a class-based approach to equality itself um, or rights under the law would um, it, I guess, encompass having two different cupcakes instead of just one for the second individual, because if they do have like qualitatively distinct rights under law, um, those things would technically be an equal. Classical liberalism disagrees with that approach. The other main approach to legal um, Justice is the opposite. It is class based rights. Over individual rights. <clears throat> and this is most of the time called equality under the law. So I'm just going to make this an acronym. EUTL. And we've already discussed how that is different from and juxtaposed with classical liberalism. So now let's get a bit critical. What do you think might be a major criticism of classical liberalism in practice? <clears throat> so let's say we 
assume that the veil of ignorance is actually the view from nowhere, and that certain people are innately disadvantages, disadvantaged in society, regardless of whether or not they can theorize that they aren't. That would mean that ensuring equality doesn't really ensure equality for all people, right? Because if you sort of are already playing the game at a disadvantage, in a disadvantaged position, just being given the same things as people who are in an advantaged position won't actually make you equal. It'll just make sure that you have given equal amounts of rights. So uh, a lot of times debates over things like affirmative action encompasses the debate between classical liberalism and equality under the law. Because the point of affirmative action policies are to lift up people who have been disadvantaged otherwise. So people of color and women, because they face disadvantages in society, like um, lack of generational wealth or employer bias against them. And if we ignore that, then they're always going to be disadvantaged relative to people who are privileged, because even if they're all given the same rights or they're all technically given the same benefits in society, they will still be left in a relatively disadvantaged position. Um, what do you think the opposite viewpoint might be as to why classical liberalism is a good approach to legal rights? Well, the major issue is that with an equality under the law approach slash sometimes called equity under the law, um, there is a bit of subjectiveness that goes into crafting policy, right? Like there's no way to gauge totally and quantitatively how disadvantaged someone is. So the question becomes, how do we change the legal structure of society, the laws that we implement to totally accomplish equity when that would have to be left up to policymakers themselves? And policymakers are individuals who have individual beliefs. So this plays into theories of sentencing, which, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, what's the difference between like equality under the law and equity under the law? It's the same thing, really. Um, equity under the law is used sometimes because equality is understood to be this approach to uh, legal justice. It's understood to be like a individual rights over class rights approach, whereas equity is the opposite. It's um, class rights over individual rights. So that lends itself to theories of sentencing, which are basic theories about how the legal system, the judicial system specifically, should go about sentencing individuals for crimes, slash like meeting out justice. Because if we understand equity under the law to be true, that not only implicates the um, legislative system, what policies should be passed, who should be relatively advantaged, but it also should affect sentencing the judges meet out because there are different circumstances which might drive people to commit crimes. So keep that in mind when you're talking about things like plea bargaining, because plea bargaining obviously affects what sentences people are handed. Um, sometimes it can be used to avoid things like bias in the judicial system, because judges do disproportionately sentence people. It's very well studied, and it's demonstrated by the data. Plea bargaining could be a way to accomplish maybe a more equitable result in a trial if a fair result is agreed upon by a defense and pros um, prosecution attorney. So before all of this, and this kind of goes back to classical theories of justice, but I went on a tangent because you're talking about justice of the legal system. Before all of this is religious justice. All right, way too large this board. Is that right? So, religious justice mostly took the form of Abrahamic justice. What are the Abrahamic religions? There are three of them. Islam. Islam. Islam, yep. The three main Abrahamic religions follow from the basic tenets of the Torah or the Old Testament and encompass Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. The reason why Abrahamic justice lends itself to legal justice more readily than things like pagan religions would is because 
in the Abrahamic text, there is a much more explicit description of God's will, whereas with pagan spirituality, those kinds of things are more or less open to individual interpretations of what the gods want or what have you. So religious justice oftentimes took the form of, um, I guess I would term this non-formal justice. It'd be things like justifying stoning based on a religious text or based on a certain excerpt, excerpt from the Old Testament or what have you. It's important to talk about this because these kinds of occurrences or events actually heavily influence the way legal systems set themselves up to meet out sentencing. Because before a lot of policies were passed that legalized things like sodomy or legalized things like um, extramarital marriage or even interracial marriage, these things were considered to be unjust and therefore punishable under the legal system because of Abrahamic tenets. And still today, some would argue that lots of policies passed are influenced by very non-value neutral understandings of justice. So these are all theories of justice in the abstract. What we'll talk about after this are um, theories of justice in application. Um, so I termed this modern justice. There are two main approaches to justice and application slash how specifically the penal system should work in applying justice to people who have been sentenced to prison terms. Um, a topic that I debated, well, first I'll ask you all, do you know what the distinct, like what the two main philosophies of application of justice are? Slash like how the penal system should operate? Yeah, well, it's retributive and rehabilitative. So what is retributive justice? I know that we've talked about this before. If any of y'all remember. Molly? Right. Retributive justice is eye for an eye. The idea is that for something to be just, it does have to be equal or even equitable. So for the legal system to apply justice in a truly, um, I suppose, utilitarian way or equal way, it would have to meet out the same punishment as the crime committed. What is rehabilitative justice? Molly? It's saying that um, basically they can be reformed and made to be Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that criminals have sort of an illness or um, a malfunction of the mind that causes them to commit crime, and they can be healed from said illness. They can literally be rehabilitated through a justice system or a penal system. What do you think our legal system, which philosophy do you think our legal system operates under? Yeah, our system is retributive in nature. We attempt to mete out punishments that fit the crime. Does anybody know of any rehabilitative justice systems or where those are popular? Mm -hmm. I feel like in like Nordic countries. Have yeah. Heard a Nordic and Scandinavian countries um, are very famous for implementing rehabilitative justice systems, and they are very effective in those areas. There's some question about whether or not that is able to be transposed and is applicable to maybe the American justice system. But if 
you ever have a topic about rehabilitative versus retributive justice, I did when I did LD debate, um, then those countries would be perfect examples of times when rehabilitative justice has gone right. So I suppose what would be the philosophy behind rehabilitative justice if we assume that justice is an accomplishment of equality? Because this seems to be much more of a philosophical approach to what should be done with criminals. Mm -hmm. Did you? Oh, OK. Does anybody have a guess? OK. The idea follows that if we assume that criminality is an illness, then it's inborn. It's not something that can be controlled. So rehabilitation accomplishes a healing of an illness that nobody chose to have, right? Which would accomplish equality under the law because some people are born with a predisposition to crime and others aren't. Um, this is not a hard distinction, meaning that there are mixed approaches to the legal system that can incorporate elements of retributive justice and elements of rehabilitative justice. And it is also called restorative justice, but I've always heard it as the latter or the former. What do you think a mixed form of justice looks like in the context of retributive versus rehabilitative? Did you have an answer? Okay. Uh, community service, maybe? Um, I guess, so I, I see what you're trying to say in concept because the idea of like handing somebody a sentence to community service is that they'll give back to the community yeah. and in that way accomplish justice, which like part of the theory behind rehabilitative justice is that criminals can give back to society. So once we heal them and achieve equality, then it'll be better for society overall. But I was more thinking that there are certain circumstances in which criminality can be proven to be pathological versus other circumstances in which it cannot be proven to be pathological. So people who have been diagnosed with things like antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy, or people who are under the influence of schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, probably have more of a risk of um, not paying attention to the social norms that dictate whether or not something is just or unjust, slash even the law itself, and may have a predisposition to criminality in comparison to somebody who um, does not have, I guess what I'll call, um, a different perception of reality. So these would be mixed theories of justice because certain people are allowed treatment under the rehabilitative system, whereas others are subjected to retributive justice. So. Um, so let's talk about util in the context, context of these theories of justice. Retributive system of justice be utilitarian in nature or accomplish more good for more people than a rehabilitative system? divorce ourselves from justice in theory and talk more about the application of these things slash how they affect criminals after being put through the legal system. And so I'll put retributive justice here. And rehabilitative here. There's one major argument for both, and we've already talked about the major argument as to why this improves societal welfare or accomplishes the greatest good for the greatest amount of people. What is that? Um, 
it's literally in the name when we talked about it, how it affects criminals. You just make them look better Yeah, it accomplishes rehabilitation. So they, once healed of their illness or predisposition to crime, can then leave the legal system or um, be released from the penal system and contribute back to society, which makes society better as a whole. So just rehabilitation. I already asked this question, but what effect do you think retributive justice has on criminals that might make it so that society operates better after it's carried out? There's a word that's used to describe the effect this has on criminals and potential criminals. It starts with a D. Uh, deterrence? Yeah. So, deterrence is the idea that people, in acknowledgement of the potential consequences of their actions, will not commit said actions because they do not want to face an eye for an eye style punishment. And obviously this is somewhat at odds with rehabilitative justice because the punishment is much more severe under a retributive system. So with the stats to prove it, you could argue that retributive justice is better for more people overall because it causes people to commit fewer crimes. That having been said, oftentimes now all of this, the ideas behind all of it at least, is thrown out because these things are understood to be, like we talked about with Raw's Bill of Ignorance, a major view from nowhere, a massive view from nowhere. So, This is the point in this lecture when we talk about social justice. So what are some major issues you think that have historically affected the justice system that maybe meant that it wasn't equal in nature? We've already talked about a few of them. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I was going. So, <laughs> one, of, one of the major issues with the justice system is that historically it's been, I mean, quite racist in nature. People have been tried for crimes that should not have been crimes in the first place, such as interracial marriage, and other people were tried for crimes and simply faced charges because of biased juries or because of biased judges, which still goes on today. So, this is tied into the idea that the legal system is innately biased and the idea that Disproportionate sentencing occurs on the daily. So, what is disproportionate sentencing? Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that one person is um, 
Yeah, so there are two components to it. One is that certain groups of people are targeted and arrested more frequently. So this I'll term subjection to legal process or processes. And then the second component of disproportionate sentencing is um, literally Um, distribution of punishment. So, can anybody think of some examples at times or just individual cases in which this occurred? Just like general trends in society. Yeah. Yes. So, um, specifically, black people are often targeted by the legal system. They're arrested disproportionately for crimes that white people commit at a higher rate, such as drug use, which is a nonviolent crime, and they're subjected to harsher sentences. And there are many, there's a lot of critical approach to why this occurs, and that debate is entirely separate. But we're going to talk about how this can be remedied in the legal system in just a second. Um, can anybody think of any other examples of times when punishment has been? inequitably distributed, or people have just been subjected to more punishment because of their class, or the class that they belong Well, I think of LGBTQ people and the Stonewall riot specifically. Um, LGBTQ people were arrested during that time and still much more frequently for crimes that can be were and could be committed by um, heterosexual people, or at least people who engaged in heterosexual intercourse for, during things like prostitution. They were arrested for being sex workers, even if that was not the case, because of their sexuality or um, their gender identity. So there are different circumstances under which disproportionate sentencing can happen. Oftentimes, sentencing is often gendered, but we'll talk about that soon. So Did you just, yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> just to know. Stop talking. Just disrespecting the whole Um. <laughs> critical race theory is much more than just a critique. It is a, it was originally um, an approach to jurisprudence. So jurisprudence being, does anybody know? It's also a common value premise. OK, I'll, write, I'll look up a formal definition and write that down for you. No, it doesn't have to do with bias. Jurisprudence is. A formal theory or approach to law. And theory here is being used in the academic sense, not in the common everyday sense of just an idea. It's something that has been written about extensively and could be tested with the social science method. So critical race theory began as an approach to jurisprudence or the formation of legal theory that assumes that the system was just innately racist, and specifically it was innately anti-black. It's important because it was very formative for later theories of critical theories about the nature of society, but it also led to um, a lot of scholarship in the legal community about how to best approach this and deal with it in terms of 
is more than anything. I'm going to talk about next a specific form of jurisprudence that sort of illustrates how social justice or critical theories of jurisprudence can be actually implemented in a legal context. So. Feminist, I'm assuming we all know what feminism is. Yeah. Um, what do you think feminist jurisprudence or a theory about the law that incorporates feminist perspective might look like? Does it say, like, discriminates against what females? Yeah. Um, the discrimination can go both ways, but it's due to an overarching patriarchal structure, like most feminist theorists would contend. So. Legalism is an enforcement of patriarchy. And there are examples of times when this could be the case. So one common, I guess, contention that people like men's rights activists make is that the legal system doesn't actually grant parental rights to fathers when they attempt to seek custody in court. A feminist, uh, especially somebody who engages in feminist jurisprudence, would say that this is because society sees women as being motherly or taking on the role of caregiver, as opposed to seeing men as the role of breadwinner or the head of household. So women are <coughs> understood to be in charge of domestication, or they are understood to be domestic in nature. And this is an example of how gendered concepts of identity and justice can result in disproportionate sentencing in another way. So the solution to this, and another case in which this happens is um, in trials of sex workers or people who have been arrested for sex crimes like prostitution, the sentencing is also often quite harsh because women are, who are um, sex workers are understood by a lot of judges to be deviants or what have you. Um, archaic points of view influence how they are sentenced. So, feminist jurisprudence contends that not only is the legal system inequitable in nature and unjust, but there is a major way to combat this, and that is called Interjection of narrative. So, what does this sound like at face value? It would encompass. What's a narrative? Oh, wait. It's not a story. Yeah, it's a story. Um, so, interjection of narrative is a legal approach that would have women um, present their own narratives in public settings, and specifically during the crafting of law. You know, they simply call the representative and present a story about themselves or how they felt that they were disproportionately impacted by the law uh, in a, a process that's known as interjection. So that, that those legal structures are not founded solely upon the ideas or with the ideas of usually white men in mind. This all having been said, and there are obviously separate approaches to jurisprudence that focus on different specific groups of people. talk about two major things, um, and then hopefully this lecture will be over. So, 
The first is intersectionality. Sometimes used as a buzzword by pop culture outlets like BuzzFeed. And then other times, it's used in a much more traditional and, I would say, legitimate context during application of legal theory. So what is intersectionality? Does anybody know? Were you? Yeah, so it's about relative privilege when it comes to one's identity. So the idea is that privilege can't be talked about in a monolithic fashion by saying, like, um, I am a woman, not a man, so I am relatively, uh, I, I do not have the privilege that a man would have in uh, a society or legal system. Um, or, like, I am black but not white, so I do not have the privilege of a white person in a society or legal system, but rather, that privilege encompasses both those things, not only at the same time, but also in a way that is unique to either of those things alone. So, And this can be spoken about in many different contexts. So, talk about ableism or disability. That'd be another access. Access, sorry. And all of these things come together to influence how one person is sort of finds their place in the legal system. So, the phrase that's commonly used is, I am the intersection of all of my impressions. Now, this is just like intersectionality 101, but how do you think this influences critical theories of justice? I guess we can pretend to like class structure, or like, or like maybe if you're in like more privilege or less privilege, then you'll be less privileged for something in the legal system, and you'll have like maybe bias towards you. And yeah. Well, most critical jurisprudence assumes that the legal system is biased towards people who have a relative lack of privilege. But specifically, intersectional theorists assume that the legal system needs to be changed, not only from like a perspective of the legal system being anti-black, or a perspective of the legal system being patriarchal, or um, anti-queer or homophobic, but that the legal system is all of these things at once. So voices that are interjected in the form of interjection of narrative need to include an analysis of their different intersecting intersecting privileges so that society begins with um, a radical approach to law. As being on the whole oppressive or the opposite of progressive. So I guess the next thing that I would like to talk about is radical approach to law. So when you think of a radical, who do you think of? What philosophy do you think of? Hitler. <laughs> I was not thinking of Hitler, who I guess could be defined as radical, but I was thinking of anarchy. Yep. So what is anarchy, by definition? Yeah, an absolute lack of law or government. Uh, 
Now, this in and of itself, it's not very pragmatic, right? There is very little way to accomplish anarchy in, in a, a time frame that makes sense or in a way that has any effect of solving the issues with law and a legal approach to human rights. But there are different variants of anarchy that actually do influence philosophy about the law. So there are things like anarcho-syndicalism, or anarcho-feminism, in which as little of the law as possible is maintained to keep society running. But this is done through creation of different kinds of social systems. So anarcho-syndicalism would pretend that or contend that the best way to organize society is around things like communes. So it's almost communist in nature, but without the overarching structure of a communist state. Anarcho-feminism, um, in opposition to that somewhat, would contend that social structure needs to exist to protect women, but that it should not exist to protect men. So, these are radical approaches to law that assume law is bad. There are other approaches to law that assume law should just not be overarching or macro in structure. So the last thing that we'll talk about is community policing. <coughs> It's under radical approach to law. So what is community policing? It's kind of self-explanatory, um, so you could probably guess, but you probably have heard this term at some point as well. Community policing is the idea that the police should not exist specifically. So regardless of the existence of a legal structure, Police equals bad. And the alternative to this is a form of organized vigilante justice known as community policing. So the idea is that individual communities know what's best for those communities. And when you invite people like the police or agents of the state into communities that largely are disadvantaged, then they're not going to apply the law in a way that is fair. So things like police brutality are a result of oppression on a systemic level influencing policing. And then a good alternative to that would be to let those communities police themselves. We have one minute left, and I think I've covered everything I want to cover, considering I did not write this lecture, because Garrett was supposed to give a comp lecture. But I'll ask if anybody has any final questions about theories of justice or what we talked about today. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem.